Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Destiny Dorks, your favorite board game design and creation podcast. And as always, shaped by you, I'm Kyle, I'm the Dork, and welcome back. This is So You Want to Make an RPG Part 2. If you missed last week's video, it's in the link in the description below. You can check it out if you want to know what I said about something called rapid prototyping. And if you followed my instructions from last video, you have probably already started to quickly and efficiently make your own RPG. So I thought we would move on to our next step, which is playtesting. Before we get into playtesting, though, I would like to say, please make sure you give us a like, a share, a comment, a subscribe. They really do help us out. And if you feel so inclined and you'd like to check out some of our games, they're in the description below. You can get physical copies from World of Game Design or digital copies over on our page, itch.io. But let's talk about playtesting. So first things first, some, some terminology, like what is playtesting uh, is probably the best place to start, especially if you're new to the game design genre. And that is simply playing your game with other people. But it's a little deeper than that, right? It's not just playing your game with other people. It's eliciting feedback. It's trying to come to an understanding of what works and what doesn't work within your own game. And it's getting other people to essentially test out what is and is not good about the game that you are making. And while we're talking about some playtesting terminology, let's talk about open playtesting, which is where you are present during the playtest, physically or digitally. So for example, if you zoomed with about six or seven people playing your RPG and you're watching, you're taking good notes, that's an example of open playtesting. Closed playtesting is when other people are playing the game, but you're not present for that. Both of them are very effective. They're both essential to the design process. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit with what to expect for either one. And I'm going to give you some tips and some tricks to help you run some play tests. So first thing for open playtesting is one of the things that we talked about last week was the microscope method, um, was the idea that you can focus on one small aspect of your game. And one of the best ways to open playtest is to specifically look at one aspect of a game or to specifically look at a rule or concept within that game and test that while you are there. The reason that you want to test a single concept like this during open playtesting is you can actually solicit feedback, you can make changes in real time, and then essentially what you can do is you can run it again. When I was playtesting one of my board games a while ago, one of the things that I did was I was like, I don't like how the economy system in this particular game works. And so what I did was we played it first for the just for that economy step, and then we did the economy step, and then I said, cool, how did that feel? Are there changes we could make? Let's run it again. And then we did. Um, that's one of the best things that you can do with open playtesting because you are there to make changes for the game, because you are there to take notes, because you are there to sort of run things. You can delve into one very small, very specific part of the game, and that's really super helpful. Another reason that you might want to do open playtesting uh, is when you really want to know game length and playability. So you can get a timer. First and foremost, you can focus on cool experiences and you can let it ride. Um, this is awesome when you're just trying to get a general feel for how long the game is going to take. For example, if you're designing an RPG and you expect it to last two hours and the playtest with the teach uh, comes up to about six hours, you know that you are very, very far from the mark that you were aiming for. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing, uh, but it is something to take into account. Um, also, being there and just sort of running the entire game from one shot from the start of it to the very end lets you kind of figure out what the core experience of that game is. For example, when I was designing After the Rain, one of the things that I would focus on was I, was like, I want to make sure that this feels like a game about loss and rediscovery. And so when I was running my playtest and those themes came up over the course of a three hour, four hour runtime, I realized that what I was doing was working and I had to hone in on those things a little bit more. Um, last but certainly not least, when you are letting it ride and you're doing a three, four hour play test, you are more than welcome to, and in fact, you should skip what does not work. Um, people are going to be giving you a lot of their time in that three or four hour window. So for example, if everyone is getting hung up on this one specific rule, skip it, move past it, or make a change and amend it so that you can continue to get good play testing time. Um, this is a little different than delving into just one specific detail, but it is helpful to know that when you are there, you can make changes on the fly. And in fact, that can be helpful. Uh, closed playtesting is something that I swear by. This is the one thing that I feel like a lot of designers do not do quite a lot of, whether it's uh, they just don't have a robust playtesting network or they're too nervous to just give the game over to people. Um, but I think closed playtesting, even more than open playtesting, is an essential thing. Why do I say that? So I love, and those of you who have playtested games for Desks and Dorks know this, I love when people record a playtest. Oh, sorry. Um, 
for a RPG that I'm designing. The reason that I like this is because people are really nice to you personally when you are in a room. They are far more likely to be polite about the experience that you have crafted um, than they are if you're not present than they will if you um, are there. So what I mean by that is people don't like insulting each other and people generally don't like to insult you, especially if you've worked really hard and they are more likely to be brutally honest if you're not in the room. Um, I loved doing this. I have two of my fantastic playtesters from uh, You've Always Lived in the Lighthouse. About 45 minutes in, they were like, well, geez, I don't know if I have any friends that I like enough to play this particular game. I would have to really trust somebody and really like someone in order to play this particular game. And I was thinking there to myself, one, no way that you would have said that to me in person. And two, yes, that's exactly the type of uh, game that we're designing is a game for people who love and trust one another or who want to build that sort of rapport and that love and trust. Um, they also made some really off kilter jokes uh, about <laughs> just like seducing a sea monster. And it was one of the funniest things that are ever those offhand comments. You don't usually get if you are present in the room because people treat it almost like, and again, I having taught a classroom, I can speak to this with some degree of certainty people treat it when like the designer is in the room with so much more gravitas they're like oh well, i don't want to speak out of turn um granted not all my playtest groups are like that the people that know me really well like screw you kyle like we're going to do whatever we want uh which is hysterical but when you are just getting to know someone those playtesters are generally really honest and really or not really honest but really not uptight that's the wrong word for it uh but more willing to stand on uh the niceties and the um, social nuances, shall we say, as opposed to providing blunt and honest feedback, which is what you would like to solicit during a playtest. Um, we're going to move on. Just I've, I've exposited a little too much about that. Um, Google Forms are your best friend when you are doing a closed playtest. We love a Google Form here at Desks and Dorks. Uh, they're great for charting things. They're great for uh, checking what the aggregate is from all of your playtests. So, for example, we had about 15, 16 people playtest after, uh, after the rain, but uh, you have always lived in the lighthouse. That was 16 people who tried it without me present. And by looking at all their Google Forms, I was able to sort of collate different responses, and I was able to be like, oh, cool, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. Uh, so, for example, when you get a copy of you, as you have always lived in the lighthouse, uh, you will see the tagline, it is reminiscent of children's card games. Originally, the rule set was inspired by Go Fish. We mentioned Go Fish pretty liberally throughout that rule book. Every playtester that I met uh, did not like the mention of Go Fish, and it was something specific that popped up uh, when I looked at the feedback, uh, the playtest feedback, and I was able to say, like, cool, three of our really dedicated groups all said, mm -mm, bad idea, Go Fish confused me. Can we get that out of the rule book? And we made that change. Now, just some general tips for playtesting, mostly just some helpful stuff to keep you all, um, you know, keep you grounded and keep you rooted while you're doing your playtest stuff. This is not necessarily, uh, how do I put this? This is not necessarily useful only for closed playtesting or only for open playtesting, but there's just some general tips. Oh. I don't expect that. Uh, sift. So not all feedback is going to be important to you. That is one of the biggest first myths of playtest design. Not everyone is going to give you feedback that is useful. Not everyone is going to give you feedback that is uh, applicable to the type of experience that you are curating. Um, it is important to think about a couple things. One, is it applicable to your game? For example, being told that you don't have a combat system in an RPG when you are clearly not trying to make a combat system in an RPG is not useful feedback, right? Some people might say, oh, I would really like this if it had a combat system. If you have no intention of ever putting a combat system in the game, it's not really helpful or applicable feedback for you. Did the people genuinely want to help? I have only had it happen once, I think in my entire career, where I had uh, someone deliberately sabotage a playtest and their feedback was, for the most part, pretty much discounted. Um, you can, like this, you do have to tread carefully, because you don't want to fall into the trap about being so loved and so attached to your design that you feel like people are attacking you. But there are some occasional bad actors or some people that just don't like your game. Um, and, and that's going to happen very, 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 very rarely. But again, um, ask yourself that question. But again, lean on the side of the caution. Most people are genuinely going to want to help. Um, are there concepts you can use or adapt? People might say something. And it might not be exactly 
the feedback they give, but it might inspire you to create a good idea. Uh, so for example, we'll go back to that combat one. Uh, maybe you weren't planning on putting combat into your RPG, but there does need to be some sort of conflict resolution management system in there to help your players. One of the best things that I could recommend is a simple notepad, just like this one. I carry this with me whenever I do a playtest. I write my notes down. I write timestamps next to those. That really helps me sift through all of the applicable feedback to see what does and doesn't work. Um, and just remember, as a general rule of etiquette, always be thankful for to your playtesters. There is nothing more precious that somebody can give you than their time. And somebody taking three, four, five, six hours out of their day, or even somebody just sitting down and taking 10, 20 minutes out of their day to play your game, that is time that they will never get back. And it is a gift. Make sure that you are thankful to your playtesters. Make sure that you are polite to your playtesters. And even if the feedback isn't something that you're going to be using or that you're going to think is particularly useful, just be kind to them. Um, be polite about it and make sure that you thank them for their time and for their expertise. Um, even in the playtests that I've had that haven't gone well, or um, if I've had a playtest where I really did think that I had a bad actor involved, um, I still made sure that I was polite, professional, and I thanked everybody for their time. Uh, it is essential for you, right? People are not always going to remember the games that you teach them. People are not always going to remember the games that you make. They will, however, remember how you made them feel. They will remember how you treated them. So as always, be thankful, be polite, and again, just be kind to your playtesters. They're doing you a huge service. Um, and my last rule of thumb, this is just something that I see a lot of newer designers doing. And I, I, when I just say designers, I mean RPG design. I am by no means a great board game designer just yet. I'm still trying to crack that nut. Um, but remember that your game is going to grow and change. If you are so married to a concept or a conceit that you are not going to allow it to change, your game is going to fail. Um, every game is going to change no matter how hard you work at it no matter what you do a game will 1000 percent change and it will grow over time not everyone is going to like your game that is okay right um uh, one of my favorite games that i made was a game called philosobots where everyone is a philosopher robot isaac one of their friends hates that game because he just doesn't like code breaking games he's like i would never play this again this is not a type of game that i enjoy and that's okay. It doesn't mean that the game is bad. It just means that that person might not be your target audience. And again, that's all right. Playing a game, testing a game, and making a game is an amazing thing. And if you are out there doing it, if you are out there making your own games, then, well, buddy, I salute you because it's a really difficult thing to do. I'll leave you with some words of wisdom uh, from a guy named Chris, who is the art director and creative director for Red Hook Studios. Um why can't I remember his last name? Anyway, uh, he gives a great GDC talk about working on Darkest Dungeon. And one of the things that he mentions is that putting an idea on paper is the scary part. Because once it's on paper and once an idea is made physical, it's made real. And then it can be critiqued. It can be edited. It can be changed. And it can be criticized. So despite all of this stuff, if you are in the process of making your own RPG, that in and of itself, I think, is an amazing thing. And I salute you for it. Um, that brings us to the end of this video on playtesting. If you have found this helpful or useful, I would really appreciate a like, a share, a comment, a subscribe. If you're interested in checking out any of our RPGs, you can do some in the link below. Uh, physical copies can be bought from World of Game Design and digital copies. We'd love if you would check out our store over at itch.io. But until next time, I am Kyle Ott for Desks and Dorks. You guys have been awesome. You've been amazing. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.